Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Akio, and if you're interested in AI product development, pricing, or open source and open core, this episode is for you. Joining me today is Dat Tran, who's the co-founder and CTO of Priceloop.ai. I'll put all his links to his socials in the description below. Check him out. And with that being said, enjoy the episode. Beyond coding. Have you played around with uh, Chat GPT? That's uh, uh, amazing stuff. Yeah, yes, I did. So I uh, I did a few coding related questions. So for example, uh, write a SQL where you filter for dates, uh, or also um, like um, Python machine learning related things. For example, um, write me a linear regression uh, uh, so that it solves this and that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the answers are quite nice. And uh, but yeah, I mean, those are very simple questions, right? Right. Uh, I, I don't think that, you know, if you would uh, ask a very hard question that, you know, uh, um, ChatGPT would uh, come up with, you know, like a proper <laughs> answer. So, yeah. uh, like, uh, I mean, for a simple question, I think it's very good. Uh, yeah. it's, it's better than when you would do it on Google or also most likely on Stack Overflow. And also, I would even say, uh, I don't even ask simple question on Stack Overflow, right? So... <laughs> for me, it's like really when I would go to Stack Overflow, these are more like very challenging questions that uh, people haven't asked before. Um, but I think that ChatGPT could, you know, be kind of the first point of contact for those more simple questions. Yeah, I think it's a, a really good baseline and like a tool to have in your toolbox. At least that's what it seems to be like on the surface level. I've asked questions here and there and it very confidently said, okay, this is the answer. And then I put it in, mm -hmm. it doesn't even compile. And then I'm like, yeah, that's not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so it still makes mistakes here and there, but it, it to me, it's very interesting. Like it's a first building block on a future, which is kind of unknown, at least to me. And it seems, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep a, a close eye to it. I'll just put it like that. I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, it, it's not really like super crazy AI, you know, that yeah. is uh, doing something out of the box, right? So... Uh, at the end of the day, uh, ChatGPT was trained on uh, data, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, especially in this case, uh, conversion, uh, conversational data um, that that people asked before in the past. So if if you probably would look for like something that is out of the box that no one has asked before, right? Or especially when there's a new technology, right? And you would ask this to uh, ChatGPT. Uh, you will probably get like nothing, right? Yeah. Um, but what it does well, and I think this is a cool thing in all this generative AI uh, related topics, um, you get a, syn a synthesis of this, right? So you get a mixture of different components, um, and uh, I would definitely see like automation, automation related topics uh, for that. Um, so th there's definitely a case for for this kind of of models. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense that it knows what is already kind of tried and true and proven based on the history that we have. But future topics and when you're trailblazing, it's not going to help you because you're doing and you're investigating and you're experimenting. And it it probably can do those based on assumptions, but so can you. So like your answers may vary there. That makes a lot of sense. But to me, I've, I've been involved in a lot of product development, but not necessarily with an AI component to it. Now I looked a little bit into your past and you've put a lot of products in production with an AI component to it. Like, is that different from like uh, uh, product development without the AI component? What makes it interesting putting that into production? Um, I would say it's not very completely different, right? Mm. So it is still uh, product development yeah. um, and it's uh, the same things apply there, right? You know, so you you still, you know, test for, for an MVP, you know, and you need to think about uh, the user interface and also the user experience uh, that comes along with that. Yeah. Um, but I think what's more or like the difference between like classical standard products, you know, without um, machine learning on top of this is actually the user feedback uh, that comes with to that. Mm. I mean, obviously in, in traditional product development, you know, if you create a website, standalone website, you ask, okay, uh, is, uh, does the user get it? You know, is it simple enough um, so that user doesn't get any guidance to use the product, right? Yeah. Um, in machine learning, Obviously, there's this stronger feedback component because 
you need to collect data, right? Or uh, like the output of, the, of, the, of, of what you created so that you feed the model again, right? So that the models improve at the end of the day. Um, and this is a cycle. It's an iterative cycle, you know, that basically, hey, you get a, a kind of feedback from, from the model. Mm. Um, and then, you know, you can reuse it again. Um, this is very important. For example, there are many cases where, 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 um, where you need it. Recommendation engines, right? Yeah. So recommendation engines, like, obviously, the, the most stupid or the most simple way to do a recommendation engine is, is uh, I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't call it AI, but you just take the most freaking clicks, you know, on the product and yeah. you show it. Or, or, or you basically just show like a, like a list that you create yourself, right? Uh, but then, you know, you need to basically, um, run, you know, more of this, uh, recommendation and, uh, like, um, sections on the product and to collect this data so that you can create more fancier models, right? And even those fancier models, they only reinforce basically what the users like. So you will never, you know, get like, uh, like an out of the box recommendation. So if you have new products, you know, that you want to introduce, you know, you need a, ba- a way how to balance basically the algorithm a rhythmic part of the product and also, mm. you know, the new part of this. Um, so there's a lot of things that you need to think about that. Um, and also what I also see, um, especially machine learning into products, I usually never see machine learning as a standalone feature right? yeah. uh, or, or, or product itself. Um, for example, even like just take chat GPT. I think it's nice, right? Like just to try it out. I mean, mm. I think I, I read that uh, it took ChatGPT three days to get like one million users, right? Which yeah, is that's crazy. Which is which is quite amazing. But obviously, would you pay for it? <laughs> would you, you know, uh, what is the use of it, right? It's it's a fun it's a fun project, and uh, you know, um, it's really nice to try it out. Yeah. But usually, uh, machine learning is part of overall product, right? So uh, you really need to, to, to think, you know, together with design um, and also with product management in general, right? How does it fit actually overall into the, in the product? I like that because that's kind of demystifying it as a whole. Because if I hear machine learning and if I hear AI, like I've read a lot of things and I've talked to a lot of people that are more knowledgeable about that. But before doing so, I was like, man, that sounds pretty complex. But if you put it like that, like it is a component of your product and the whole product development life cycle in and of its own doesn't really change. You just have to accommodate for this component and that can be gathering the user feedback and feeding it back into the model to refine it and to hone it and to make it better. Then yeah, it's just a component of a product that you're building it. And for ChatGPT, it can be a component of a product, but it is not like it is right now. Right now we just have the component and we can play around with it. But like you said, I wouldn't pay for it, maybe for like a month to try out. But yeah, I've already stopped trying it out because I was like, oh, this is fun. And then that was that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But when we zoom into what you're doing now, I saw you were very much involved in Price Loop AI. Like you're one of the co-founders and you're CTO in there as well. Can you explain to us what, what problem does it solve to start off with? Yeah. So um, at Price Loop, um, we are actually basically building a new, a novel way of how business can run their pricing. Mm. Um, and if you, if you, I mean, I'm not, I'm not quite aware of like how, how much you are into the pricing space, yeah. but, uh, today's pricing is, uh, very manual or rule based, right? Yeah. Um, and, um, especially when we think about like our first customer, uh, segment, which is Amazon. So, uh, there are a lot of Amazon sellers who basically, you know, they, they put the prices once, you know, when they started the shop. Yeah. Um, and obviously they do promotions, uh, but nothing else, right? So okay. what we are, what we're aiming to do is, is, uh, for, for them to create a solution so that they can make better data driven decisions, right? Yeah. Um, because, because prices, they change, uh, because, and especially in, in, in times like that, where we are, you know, going into like a recession or we are already in the recession, uh, where basically, uh, inflation drive costs very up. And you need to basically increase your price because if you stay at the same price now, right now at the same time, you're basically making a loss, right? Yeah. Um, and what we're also building, um, or what we also realize is that pricing, as I said, is, is manual and rule based and it will still be rule based and manual for, for many, many, many companies. Uh, and it's very complex. So we actually, you know, uh, have customers who obviously have a thousand of products. 
Uh, and within these products, you have different marketplaces, right? You have Germany, yeah. you have France, you have, uh, you know, whatever marketplaces that you can add to it. Um, and then you also have variations out of this product. So you have a main product, you have variation A, variation B, variation C. Uh, and then you have, you know, complex rules that says, hey, okay, variation A, variation B needs to be priced like that. Uh, variation C, variation D needs to be priced like that. So it's a very, like, kind of like a complex uh, like if then block, I would say like this, right? Interesting. Um, and, and therefore what we built is, um, we built a, also a no code spreadsheet, um, which actually handles like uh, large data amounts. Um, mm. and it's the UI is, uh, as I said, still resembles like a spreadsheet because, uh, many of our users, especially pricing managers, they, you know, they work before with, with, with Excel and, and also Google Sheets. Yeah. So they are actually used to that kind of like user interface, um, before. Um, and I always found the idea actually quite interesting, you know, that to take, uh, kind of like a spreadsheet on Excel as an, as a UI. Yeah. Um, because in my, in my previous jobs, uh, when I was, um, uh, at Idealo, so it's a, it's a price comparison, uh, website here in, in Germany. Um, it's actually one of the uh, Europe's biggest price comparison um, service. Um, I actually have, for example, like um, the CM team to set up kind of like automation or automated related process with data because yeah. they want to wanted to do uh, data driven campaigns um, that was taking basically uh, backend data from from our from our um, um, service. Right. Yeah. Um, the the issue though was that you know. Um, as you know, right, in an IT company, uh, especially in also in like maybe like a normal company, you have so much priorities, right? So exactly. business asks, hey, can you please do this for us? I, I, we, we created this already, this idea, you know, on the whiteboard. We also, you know, have a, have a small proof of concept, uh, in, in Excel. Uh, but how do we automate that? You know, how do we basically get this into, uh, like at this time into Salesforce? Because this is what the CM, um, application that, that the team use. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, you know, I was like, uh, yeah, you know, uh, like the, the main IT team didn't really have the time for that. So I basically built a, a proof of, a proof of concept, you know, and that also, uh, put it into production. So I, at that time I used Apache Nifi. Apache Nifi is, is a, is a, is a kind of a workflow pipeline tool. Yeah. Um, it's very old fashioned, <laughs> but the idea <laughs> is, is, is really nice, you know, so you, you have a GUI, um, you can basically put, um, like a source in there, like a data source. You can basically do some transformation. Um, and then you can send it to, to, to your main system, right? Um, and that's basically what we also doing right now with our, this no code spreadsheet tool. You can get data into our solution. Mm. You can basically, uh, do data transformation in a very simple way. Uh, it's a pipeline, right? Because every column, if you think yeah. about it, it is, a, it's a flow, right? Because, because the column can depend on another column. Uh, and we, and, and basically you can uh, put up your rules and then you can take that basically into your production system again, because uh, behind that, we also, uh, put a lot of software engineering best practices into, into the solutions. So yeah. for example, it's type safe, which means that basically, uh, the type that we put into a column, it can only either be a number, be a string, you know, also be JSON. So we introduce uh, this JSON data type as well. Um, because when you think about Excel and, Google spreadsheets, you can have any types, right? You can put, <laughs> you, 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 you can, yeah, you can put a number there and then you change, you, you know, you put a string. And if you would take that sheet into your production system, right? I can tell, tell you that it will break, uh, you know, in, in a production system. Or also another thing is, uh, obviously it's not a database, right? Excel mm. or Google sheets, which means, yeah. for example, if you have like thousands of data, so, uh, for now, we have one customer. We actually like did a proof of concept with Google Sheet, um, and the amount of data actually increased to just three hundred thousand rows. I think with twenty columns. Okay. Uh, and you know, when I would search for for a value now, uh, also just go through the sheet, it's really laggy. So it's yeah. really really slow already. So um, and yeah, we're trying to take in all the disadvantages of uh, you know using Excel and, and, and Google. Um, uh, Google Sheet into our tool yeah. um, and become more like, you know, the, the a better middleware between basically business and also uh, the IT department. Very interesting. I thought because 
I've always seen people from a more business sense work with spreadsheets and I've always thought like, don't we have a better way of visualizing the data? So it's interesting to me that you still, I mean, you remove kind of the pitfalls of the previous spreadsheets that are there and you improve on those. But the visualization is still what people are familiar with because it's still a spreadsheet in, at the end of the day. Have you, have you considered like different visualizations or, or tried different things in there as well? Uh, yes, actually, uh, this is actually a very good question because, um, like when I, when I started price soup together with my co-founder, uh, at the time I always thought we're going to take that, uh, flow chart, you know, like flow base, uh, basically yeah. pipeline, um, as, as our main, uh, basically user interface. I mean, there's, there's many, many tools out there that uses already, right? So, uh, you have, uh, prefect airflow, right? Where, where they have this, this flow chart. Obviously it's no, not no code and low, low code completely, right? So you yeah. really have to write a lot of code to create these pipelines. Um, but I always, I, when I, when I, when I, when I, uh, thought about that, um, I thought there was built a lot of limitations that you have with this, uh, flow charts. Mm. Um, I mean, it's very easy for people to see flows, right? You have yeah. a source, you have a sync, you know, you set a, a node like from, from A to B, right? Or to something else. And then you see the flow of, you know, things going through. But it's, it's a bit intransparent, right? Because if you work with data, especially a lot of data, um, you do transformation in between these flows, but yeah. you really don't see, you know, how the transformation, you know, in the data. So, uh, and it's actually quite costly because I always thought, you know, you take every node and then you do a transformation on every node. Uh, and then you end up something, you know, with like maybe, for example, a final optimal price or final optimal output. Yeah. Um, but in between, when I see the flow, it's very in transparent. It's magic. Um, so, yeah, it's magic, right? And um, then I thought about Excel or, or, or Sheet. Um, and because at that time, we, we were doing our first MVP. Uh, our first MVP was completely, you know, different from, from what we uh, built today. It was like, yeah. you know, this, this standard dashboard. Uh, I mean, a lot of, a lot of solutions, uh, use dashboard, right? Mm. So if you, if you think about like, uh, um, like typical SaaS applications, they, they do like a, a normal dashboard. You know, you go in, um, you have your functionalities to automate certain stuff. You see numbers and so on. It's pretty nice, but it's very inflexible. Right. Yeah. So that, that, that is something that we started with. Um, but we knew that we need something more flexible because every of our customer have different rules, different logic, you know, they want to do different things, different industries, right? So at the moment we serve the e-commerce uh, industry, but you know, when you go to airlines, when you go to a hotel, they have much, uh, different, different, um, kind of rules and, and, uh, logic there. Yeah. Um, and then, and then over the time, I realized that uh, like my co-founder and also, um, one of, even one of our data engineer and also our product venture, they, they use Excel and, uh, uh, especially in this case, Google Sheet to solve the problems before we actually turn it into SQL code and also Python. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. So I was like, wow, why, why can we not, you know, just take like the solution that we had already in Google Sheet, right? And put this into production and stuff instead of actually translating, you know, the, the, the solution that we put in, in an Excel sheet into SQL or Python again, right? Yeah. So I was really like, hmm, okay. Um, and then I thought, oh, wow, yeah, an Excel sheet and Google Sheet is actually also just a flow, but it's more visible. It's more transparent because exactly. every column that we do, uh, you can see actually the transformation already, right? And you can see the flow of the data. Um, and the coolest thing is, uh, with our tool right now, we, we actually like, uh, in the, in the core, we actually built a dependency graph. So, um, it's, it's some, it's a feature that we have also on our roadmap that actually when you would, for example, have different tables, you know, different, uh, sheets, how we would call it. Yeah. Uh, and then you could add like 20, 30 columns, uh, that, uh, kind of depends on each other, but also on different tables. And then if you would click onto one of the column, you can actually see the dependency, you know, ah, from, okay. from, from the source to the, to basically this final column. Yeah. So this is something that, you know, I, I haven't seen in, in any other like spreadsheet tool so far. Um, and it's very actually important, you know, for, for, for especially businesses because they, they create logics, right? And they want to see, okay, what is actually, you know, the entire logic, um, based on all the tables and all the uh, columns that I created so far. Yeah. 
I, I love that because in my head, exactly as you mentioned, a, like a flow chart or it, it depends because if you have a lot of data, it's it that's also going to take a lot of like overhead and like cognitive capacity. So I like that you iterated on top of that. You came in with an assumption. You were like, okay, we can improve on this. And then at the end of the day, your customers were still like working with spreadsheets and working around what you saw. So you took that with you and you're like, okay, then apparently this is a good baseline, but we can still improve on top of this. And probably if you look at the end product now, it's completely different that we started off as an MVP. But that is exactly what you need at the end of the day to make your product succeed. Listening to your customers and actually letting go of your assumptions that you initially thought were right, right? Even though that is completely going to bias you, you also have to let go of that if it turns out to be wrong due to practice, basically. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. I mean, I mean, this is always uh, like the thing, right? So... Uh, you start with an hypothesis, right? You start with like our own ideas, yeah. uh, and then you you create basically like a like a, a mock. So that's actually what we do. So we actually create mocks, um, um, and then you know we also talk to customers. We do user research, uh, also all in sales pitches, right? We're also trying to to get a gut feeling of okay, does a does does the does the user get it, right? Yeah. Does he understands um, the value out of this? And then you should like create a proof of concept. Right, and then really understands. Okay, uh, does it make sense? So, so for example, when when um, like after our first MVP, so I was really unsure if uh, basically the table, right, the table as UI would yeah. actually be like understood kind of by by pricing managers and so on, or in general by by our users. Um, and then you know we basically first like create our next MVP on top of the table, um, and uh, yeah, basically deploy it to to the, this one customer that we had, and he clearly understood already how to use it, right? Because it was a table. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but obviously in this table um, that we did, it was a data table. So it mm. was not like an Excel spreadsheet that you can do this. So what we put there was basically, yeah, you can turn off, you know, a, a, like a button, like a toggle, right? You yeah. can change basically some values, um, but it was not really like you can go in and create a column and, and do this and that. It was already flexible enough, right? So at the time, so you, we, we had a backend where we basically uh, we, we, we put some of our like blocks that we called. So for example, yeah. like a min margin block, a min and max price block. Um, and, and basically we could, for every new customer, we could basically, you know, like create like a JSON file that we had in our backend and then basically deploy it for every customer differently. But yeah. the problem was at the time, Wow, if we would need to do that for every customer, <laughs> right? Every customer to create those JSON files, that would actually, you know, be, be very, very unscalable, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, it was fine because we created this MVP in a fast way to get an understanding of, of does the table work and does a customer get it? And and uh, the feedback was really amazing. So uh, you know, he 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 understood it. You know, he 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 knew how to use it, and also he had ideas. Oh wow! So if I can I probably add another, you know, like, like another block to it. So another yeah. rule block. Um, and he said, yeah, you can do it, but you need code. So you need us to do that for, for you. <laughs> yeah. Right. But, uh, but the feedback was actually, wow, it would be actually quite cool if he could do it. Right. Yeah. If the person, you know, can create this block by themselves, by himself, you know, based on, on documentation. Um, and, and therefore, you know, the idea of this flexible, no code tool was, you know, then, then, then exactly. born in a way, because yeah. then we, we got all the re requirements together, like, you know, how we should structure that. Um, and, uh, yeah, now you can actually try it out. So you can go to, to price tube, you know, we have our alpha version, uh, release. So, yeah. uh, we released it like one and a half months ago. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're developing really hard. I mean, it's, I can tell you, uh, it's a very complex product to build on. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, I mean, just based on the things you explained, like pricing and competitiveness there, like with variants and different marketplaces and different countries, even and different competitors, like that's already a lot of data. Especially, I mean, I, I have a little history in e-commerce, so I know like the various amounts of products that can go in there, plus the variants also. Yeah, that I can see how that gains in in complexity there. But you and me talked before the show and you mentioned something interesting in that you're thinking about or you already have open source part of your code or even all of it. Can you walk me through that thought process? Like why why do you think or are you thinking of open sourcing a lot of things? 
Yeah. So so right now we we only open source part of it. So yeah. which means that for example how you can create custom functions uh, also uh, basically uh, our API connection with Python so mm. uh, to 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 our to our uh, uh, our platform um and also um we are basically you know cleaning up uh, our <laughs> our entire project because yeah. you know when when you develop so we have been developed obviously in self mode for 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 a couple of months, right? Yeah. You you had a lot of uh, kind of you know technical debt, I would call it. You know, <laughs> a lot of unclean code and so on, and sure, and yeah. we we need to clean it up before we we're gonna you know go go full blown open. Mm. Um, but yeah, in terms of your question, like what is the thought process around that? So um, I'm not quite sure if you like familiar with the term modern data stack. Um, really. Can yeah, you explain? So, it? So the modern data stack is is basically like an open source uh, ecosystem, mm. um, which uh, comprises of basically tools that modern data people would use, right? Okay. Um, and if we, you know, like uh, just think about it again, like what is our tool, or what is what is the what is the tool that we created doing? It's also a data tool, <laughs> right? Because people uh, they move data into our solution. Um, and then, you know, they do some transformation with that, with our UI. Um, and then, you know, you, they can export it back to any of their uh, production system. You know, yeah. you know, maybe it's an ERP, maybe it's a database, right? Um, and within this modern uh, data stack, you know, you have different tools there. So you have Airbyte for ETL, ELT. Uh, you have uh, Prefect and Airflow, for example, for orchestration. Um, you have DBT, right? So for basically uh, kind of a modern SQL transformation and versioning, right? Um, so everything around transformation, um, and then and then you have also like dashboard solutions like Light Dash and so on, right? So that mm. it basically combines the idea of DBT uh, and basically adding a, a nice BI solution on top of this. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, when I when I when I think about pricing or uh, in general, pricing is a data project. Right. So in, in pricing, you, 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 uh, you take data. So you, you, you take uh, different data sources, obviously internal data sources from ERP systems. Uh, but then also you combine it basically with external sources, right? So comparative tracking data, right? Uh, maybe weather data, uh, and, and many other data that, that you can, that you would need for your, for your, for your, uh, pricing in general, right? Yeah. Then you would clean this data. You would combine this data together, do some joins. And then, you know, uh, maybe you have, uh, like rule based logic on top of this or also like a machine learning based model. And then you export that data, right? Mm. So within this whole ecosystem, you probably use some of this modern data uh, stack, right? Like, like, uh, Airbyte to move data from A to B, use DBT to transform the data. And then maybe you use Light Dash or, or Superset, right? One of the, um, like, um, visualization tools to visualize the data. Yeah. Um, and our tool is also in between you know, of the modern data stack because at the end of the day, you know, we want to connect with, with, uh, with Airbyte, right? So we want to, you know, at some point basically uh, have an Airbyte connector to our solution so mm. that, you know, people move data to our solution, uh, to our platform. Uh, and then they, you know, can, can do their custom logic in their trans transformation. We also, uh, offer like a, like a way for developers to write their own custom functions. So you can, for example, write uh, your function in Python uh, or in Go or in JavaScript um, and then deploy it to our platform and yeah. then use it within the spreadsheet cell, right? So, so for example, uh, I built a, a few simple functions like just to get your GitHub stars or something like this, mm -hmm. right? Um, you can then, you know, uh, put in your um, like organization and repository, and then you get get your GitHub stars automatically, right? Yeah. And that basically refreshes at the moment every twenty four hours, um, and 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 then basically you know all all of these features that you can in there, uh, and once you are done, you export your data, and you can use Airbyte again, and then you can maybe use another like um, tool to visualize your data. Um, and at the end of the day, um, since we want to become basically part of this modern data stack. Yeah. Right. Uh, we want to also, you know, want to have adoption because, um, like at the end of the day, we are building a platform that at some point also goes beyond pricing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Pricing, uh, obviously, if you think about the spreadsheet, like 
Excel spreadsheet, right? People are not using an Excel spreadsheet just to do pricing. Do <laughs> they are doing everything. more. <laughs> yeah. It runs they businesses. Do, <laughs> yeah. Yes. It runs businesses, right? So you, you can use it for CM. You can use it for, I don't know, supply chain management, right? You can use it for, for anything that you can think of it, right? Yeah. Um, and, and basically, you know, we are, we are building a syntax that is, they're very close to Excel, but it's still different. Mm. Uh, and also bu building functionalities that are like different, right? So for example, when you, when you on, on a Google sheet, you, they have the concept of app script, right? So you, you need yeah. tab script basically to write custom function. When you go to Excel, you need to write VBA, right? Obviously modern, modern Excel, uh, I think also supports TypeScript now, but mm. it's still not like, you know, you can choose Python or, or Go, especially Python is very important for the, for the data space because this is actually, uh, the, the one, the first programming language that every data, you know, practitioner would go to, uh, yeah. when you st go into this field, right? Um, and, and yeah, therefore, when we do open source, you know, we, we want like people to, to, to adapt our platform, right? Okay. So that, you know, basically, uh, because if you are in a, in a close form solutions, it's, it's very challenging, right? Yeah. Because people, you know, wow, I, I need to pay for that to use this, you know, and, 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 and then they it's a hurdle, right? Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, for example, for me, most modern, like also tech stack and also businesses, they actually, do open source, right? So they have a open source component that makes sense uh, to it. Exactly. But so for me, the custom functions are a great example because that, that kind of makes the bridge in my head to like IntelliJ where you can make your own plugin. They're like, okay, we don't have it, the plugin for this programming language, but you can make it because everything around creating a plugin is open source, right? And you can add that into your own IDE because you can create your own plugins in a way. But for them also, everything that they have, at least as far as I know, I don't know if it's a lot of things or everything, but are you planning to open source like all of the things that you've built so far? Or is it only like the plugin components that can kind of plug and play with your core that is still mm. kind of closed in that way? Yeah. So so obviously we will not open source everything. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we are, we are still a business uh, at the end of the day and yeah. uh, um, uh, we have to make money you know, in order to, to, to basically uh, like continue with, with, the, with the business. Yeah. Uh, what, we, what we'll do is, is basically the core, right? The core is basically uh, like, like it's on our plans, right? To, to have the spreadsheet around that and uh, also like uh, the basics custom functionalities, right? Yeah. Um, um, ideally, you know, we also, like someone clones our repo and also can start locally, you know, uh, like the, the platform itself. Um, but obviously everything like that is like business related, right? Yeah. So for example, pricing logic, we build a few, for example, pricing domain specific custom functions, right? Mm. So we build a, for example, um, so we are, we are working together with uh, price API where where basically, you know, you can get competitive uh, tracking data, right? Yeah. Um, and obviously, this function, these kind of functionalities, we will not open source because you know this is more like for our uh, b business users and um, customers. Yeah. Um, functionalities that that basically are critical for them. Um, and also, at some point, um, we also have plugins that are really like more for our customers. Mm. You know, so at the end, for example, right now. Um, we are working with um, Amazon customers um, and we have a lot of Amazon integrations, right? So this kind of integration, obviously we will not, you know, just, just put it out in the, uh, in the wild. Yeah. Um, and it's fine because at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, what do you want to do with an Amazon integration, right? As a, as a, as a developer, I think what you want to do is maybe you have a hobby project, you know, you want to automate yourself something, uh, or also, you know, maybe you are, you are, you are a small company and you want to write your own like super pricing uh, there as well, right? Yeah. Um, and then at some point, you know, you realize, oh wow, it's uh, it's a lot to 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 manage, you know, the platform because uh, this is the thing with open source. Open source doesn't mean that when companies put it out there that actually you would you know use it and deploy it yourself, mm. <laughs> right? This is this is not the point. I mean, for example. We use Prefect, right? Uh, uh, obviously, you know, uh, it's open source. We could, you know, we could host it yourself. Uh, you know, we could host uh, it on our own server, you know, yeah. and then not pay to, to Prefect at all. 
obviously, you know, we don't do it, right? Because if, if I would host Prefect myself, you know, I would have like just a dedicated engineer to, yeah. to basically, you know, manage that basically every day and on a day to day business. And, and just, it's just adds up, right? So we, we, our company, you know, is based a lot on, on, on open source technologies. And, uh, some of them, you know, we obviously pay because they have managed hosted services. Yeah. And we are happy to do that because every service that we need to host on our site, we have to manage that and, and managing it. It's very costly because you need DevOps engineers to handle that and finding good DevOps engineers, right? It's, it's very challenging. And also, I don't want to, you know, have a full team of engineers here <laughs> that is on everything. the, yeah, that is maintaining everything. And that is also, you know, on the weekend, you know, uh, needs to be uh, on a, uh, available just yeah. basically to fix uh, stuff that we basically, you know, have a service provider that could do it for us. And that's yeah. the thing. You know? So I, I think, uh, I, if some people, I mean, this is more like the concept for business people because some business people just think, Oh, if you put it open source, you know, you could just take it, you know, and, and, it. And, yeah. and, then, and then, and then that's it. And then basically deploy it yourself and not really pay, but they haven't, they haven't thought it through, right? Because no. what, what I just said, you know, it's, it's very costly. Yeah. And I mean, it's a, it's a risk, right? That is not core of your business. Like that's an add on. And it's way easier to get it off the shelf from someone that's already hosting it and just take it as a service, right? It's value both ways. If you take it on your own, you also get the risk of running it on your own. And your user group is just you, right? Their user group is, is way bigger. So they accommodate for that as well with regards to security and risk management and uptime and everything. If you take all of that in-house, then yeah, all of a sudden you're trying to run their company but not next to your own company. Like that doesn't make any sense, especially if you have multiple of those. Yeah, definitely. I mean, all the points that you said, right? So, uh, security, right? it's a big topic. Just yeah. imagine, you know, you, you're, you're running our platform in the future by yourself. Uh, and I mean, we are, we are running on a highly protected, uh, servers, right? Behind a VPC. Yeah. Uh, and if you need to manage yourself and if you have a data breach, right? You basically have a, like, you know, a, a kind of a lawsuit against yeah, you, right? That's it. And that's, <laughs> and, 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 you know, maybe, your, your business is, is not pricing. <laughs> you know, your yeah. business is really just an e-commerce shop. And basically, you know, you have more problems with that. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, a lot of the developer tools that I've used out there, they, they are open source and they call themselves open core as well. Whereas I think the CTO of HashiCorp has kind of this strategy mindset in there that he says, if it's for developers, if it adds value to engineers, then it should be open source. And if it really adds value only when it's an enterprise, you can put a price point on it. Because then, yeah, from an enterprise point of view, you have different business models. And then all of a sudden, it makes sense to use this open source differently than an individual would if you're talking about a developer or engineer. So that's yeah. also, if you look at Docker or even HashiCorp and a lot of the other like developer tools out there, they have an enterprise price point and otherwise it's open and it is also open source. So then all of a sudden, you have this community around it that can already adopt it. And that's also how it then penetrates probably the B2B market, which is... To me, it's an interesting model because we didn't used to have that. Like it was licensing or something that Red Hat did where it's just like offering support and and basically contracting, I guess, when setting things up. Yeah. Like this is a new business model that is more out there and more up and coming. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you, if you think about that uh, new business model, it's actually the business model to go because yeah. uh, when you think about like a close solutions right now, like for example, if Docker would be a close solutions, I don't think that, you know, everyone would use Docker now, you know, and have Docker everywhere. The same thing for, for HashiCorp. So we also use a Terraform a lot, yeah. right? Uh, I don't think that I would use Terraform or adapt Terraform if that would be like for me a close solution. Yeah. Right? And I would try, I, I, I mean, I'm a developer, right? So, uh, at the end of the day as well. So I would like try out things, right? And see if it's like technically, like good and especially you know if it's a community behind that right yeah. that would drive like kind of the development because in in close solutions you have you have a small team you know you don't really have the feedback that basically you would get in the in the wide you know in the open because uh when you go open you know you just get much more feedback you know you also get contribution uh, at some point yeah. uh if people would use it and if people you know a developer would see the value out of it um then you would just also get things on your platform that you haven't thought about. Or maybe also pe people will use it in a way 
that you haven't thought about that, right? Yeah. So you get a lot of ideas how people would use technology. And at the end of the day, uh, we also like are creating a, a tool stack, right? And we want to see how basically at the end of the day, developers will use our tool. Yeah, yeah. There is so much value that comes with opening it, right? And also, I mean, if I see a price point on a product I want to use, that's such a hurdle. I'm like, I'll just try an alternative. Like, I'm not going to pay for that stuff. Even if it's like a trial thing, I'm just yeah. like, nah, I'll move on to something else where I don't have to pay it and I can just kind of fiddle with it. Because that, at the end of the day, like from an engineering point of view, you try a lot of options and you also try the options that are most accessible to you. And from there, you make your, your pros and cons, right? And you pick based on that. But if you're not even in the running, if you're not even an option because there's a price wall there, yeah, then you're never going to get adopted as widely as Docker is or Terraform is or like any other tool that's in the kind of developer tool belt nowadays. Yeah, it's an interesting thing, man. I was wondering, because you have the, the CTO role and you also come from a developer background, I was wondering like how much is your time still spent on hands-on coding and how much is mm -hmm. it more so like the CTO roles and responsibilities that you have now? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, this is probably that uh, a lot of people ask, right? <laughs> so, uh, have you, have you stopped coding yeah, exactly. <laughs> once, once you become, uh, you know, management? Um, I'm actually quite still in a happy spot because mm. we were, we're still a small team. So we are not like, uh, 100 plus engineers or something like that. Yeah. So we're, we're like, uh, 12 engineers, uh, and spread between two teams. Um, and I'm still pretty much involved into coding, right? Mm. So I still also, um, you know, if the team has some, uh, capacity issues, you know, I jump in, uh, and add new features. Uh, but I also, you know, just help the team to, to debug, uh, certain stuff. Um, um, so kind of like, you know, the guy for like the Swiss knife and to do everything yeah. around this and that. Um, and, uh, yeah, but. Uh, obviously, what I need to do balance is is also um, like the the time that I spend on coding, I spend less time basically on product development, you know, uh, and also so aligning. So uh, uh, I think when I when I started with PriceTube, obviously it was a lot of coding in the beginning because you know it was uh, quite 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 new. You know, we didn't have anyone, so I, I still you know get my hands dirty. So yeah. There's a lot of, of coding. Then basically when the team got hired, I reduced it to quite a lot. So it was more than, you know, like, uh, like, uh, getting the vision right, getting the requirements, mm. you know, creating the culture, uh, hiring, obviously, right. Uh, product development, like, you know, all, 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 everything around that in sense of like, you know, you do brother, uh, user research, uh, talking to customers. Um, and then, and then basically, uh, also, you know, getting the team on board. Like, uh, um, because obviously when you start, <laughs> you just don't know what you <laughs> are getting in, right? So, exactly. Yeah. You need to, to, to basically have a good onboarding for everyone. Um, and then, and then basically when this team settles in, uh, I, you know, started to code more as well, right? So based on the time that I have, um, and now I think it's a balance. So I, I, I would say that I code 10 to 50% of my time, yeah. right? Um, and, uh, coding is just not always just, you know, Create new features, but I said like uh, also bug fixing and QA and all the things, right? Yeah. Um, and everything else is basically like management roles uh, and also you know communication between teams, managing teams. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and try to make everyone happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love that you highlight that it's like it's a growing position, right? And you start off obviously in MVP phase. You have a lot of hands-on work to do because you want to deliver that as fast as possible. But as you onboard more people, your roles and responsibilities change. And all of a sudden, other like the things that you're accountable for are more highlighted, right? And are more important than you being hands-on on a code, on a keyboard, basically contributing in yeah. that way. Which is really cool because I always thought like, I mean, that's very much so because it's in a startup. I think in bigger organizations, it's a bit more tried and true. But I like the highlight that it's just the Wild West sometimes in a startup and it... it really depends on the context and the situation where your value is. And I think a great CTO really just has to first see the value that is there and also then be like, okay, what are the trade-offs here? What can I delegate? And what do I need to do in this position now? I think that's really yeah. cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I was, as a final thought I still had, because I always think this is interesting, the first hire, was that like pre-MVP or was that post-MVP? And how did like hiring that first person or onboarding the first person go? Um, 
So f- hiring the first person was actually pre MVP. Mm. So um, I think uh, as a, we started in uh, October 2020, yeah. um, and our first hire uh, was already in I think end of November, starting of December, if I remember correctly. Oh, pretty so quickly. So it was uh, really pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, and the first hire actually was uh, coming through my personal network. So uh, mm. uh, he used to work for me before. Uh, so therefore, it, it was not really like difficult to 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 go out because to be honest, hiring if you if you are like a first time CTO yeah. and if you don't have a network before, uh, I think hiring is very challenging. <laughs> like especially if you don't have a network, like uh, it's it's like finding good engineers or finding like you know someone like at that at that point because. Obviously, when you work for a startup, it's different when you work for a corporation. Yeah. <laughs> because in a, in a startup, there's a lot of chaos in the beginning. It's very unclear where to go. And it's very radical, right? So uh, whereas when you would be in a corporation, it's more settled. You know, you have, uh, obviously, I mean, hopefully you have revenue. <laughs> right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hopefully you're, you're not making loss and so on. Uh, and you have a stable product that you use already on a daily basis, right? Yeah. Um, when you, when you first hire, you know, uh, or hire, like you need to basically hire people that are very suited to startups yeah. because, because many people are not really used to this radical change. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and because in a startup, you know, uh, from one week to another, you know, priorities might change completely. Yeah. Right. Um, and I've seen some of our past engineers, I would say if I, if I look at this like backwards, they were not really used to that like, you know, this radical change. So yeah. they, they were really frustrated with, with basically, ah, oh, no, you know, you need to give me things that, you know, stays for three weeks or longer because <laughs> this is what I'm used to, right? Yeah, that's but, comfortable. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, but this is, this is, this is like the, the corporate mode, right? Exactly. In the corporate mode, you know, you have uh, people who, you know, they, they need security, right? So they want to know what is basically the goal of this quarter and, you know, it has to be defined very, very, like, you know, you know, in a waterfall level completely. Yeah. And then you're going to work on that, right? In a startup, obviously you also have a goal, what you want to achieve in the quarter, but reaching this, 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 this goal, you know, can, <laughs> can go, go from by day to day, you know, yeah. from week to week. And, uh, until you, you have something more concrete, right? But I think that that is the fun out of this, right? That you yeah. are actually looking, you know, for the solution. And not really like, you know, you have a solution already and, and you just come in and then just build it because then, you know, then, then, then it's not a startup. Exactly. Like it's a, it's a different type of fulfillment. And I think the highs in a startup are going to be way higher than maybe a traditional corporate job would be. But there's also, yeah, there's lows that are going to be lower probably. And there's high risk and high reward in there as well. But that probably makes it just a, a fun journey to be on. That's yeah, definitely. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> How did you get your network? Because you, you mentioned that as kind of the key factors in hiring that first person. How did you get your network up to a point where that was just like a, a comfortable hire for you as a first hire? Um, I mean, I mean, I obviously I before founding Price Loop, uh, yep. this was not my first job, so I, I was I, <laughs> experience. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I already had some experience. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I used to work for Axel Springer. It's a media company. I, I headed the AI division there. Uh, I was at Diallo before, and I also started, you know, career my career at Pivotal, uh, like a U.S. Uh, software company. So mm. they are they are no part of uh, VMware, um, but basically, you know, over that time, I already started to you know create a network. Right? Yeah. So I I always you know love writing, so I I always shared content um, that. Um, was actually not intended to grow the network <laughs> because, <laughs> because yeah, yeah. Cause, cause some people always ask me what is your strategy to to increase the network i i, I also want to you know increase my LinkedIn count and all of the stuff and i said yeah you know i, I didn't really have a strategy before there. <laughs> I, <love> I, that. <laughs> I, I was like you know I, I actually just took it uh kind of like to to remember what I, uh, uh, I, I mean, I, I read, right? And I and uh, people, you know, just like it and so on. And also, you know, I love writing and and uh, uh, blog posting. So uh, at the time, obviously, you know, I was writing up my knowledge that I learned, so that I can, you know, remember that. And obviously, you know, oh, okay, cool. If I already write it, you know, I can share it there, here and there. And yeah, people liked it. <laughs> yeah. So um, and then I also. You know, saw the value in open source uh, mm. because uh, you know when I 
for example, when I started at Idealo, um, um, it was actually my first head position. So my okay. first leadership position. Uh, and I was pretty young. So actually that was, I only had two and a half years experience and it was a head of uh, data product role. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, a big one. Yeah. And actually the thing is I applied for that role. Uh, yeah. So the, it's a funny story because the role requirements was like, they were looking for someone eight plus years, yeah. uh, work experience, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, have, have managed, you know, larger teams and do that. I didn't do any of this. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, I was like, I was really bold. You know, I was like, you know, I was like, uh, I was showing them, uh, what I did, you know, at Pivotal that kind of, you know, would also show that I managed teams also obviously during university time, uh, I was also leading organizations and, and everything else already, right? So it's not yeah. like, you know, I, I never had leadership uh, uh, positions uh, within, but not, you know, in a, in a, in a professional context. Um, yeah. And, and then, you know, I applied for it and uh, I, I got a, I got an invite. <laughs> so I, I, I talked to the CTO, you know, he liked me. Uh, and then I actually was able to pitch my ideas to the CEO, right? To the managing director uh, yeah. at the time. Um, and yeah, I got in, I got the position, uh, even <laughs> though, even though, you know, the, the job description was completely off from, from, <laughs> from, from my level and, and everything else. Uh, and, and, and basically, you know, at the time when I joined Idealo, I also was, uh, like one of the strategy was to do open source. Mm. Uh, Idealo hasn't done open source, like a, a proper strategy, right? Yeah. Um, because, because, um, obviously when I started at Idealo, I didn't had a, like, big network before. So the network was quite fine. You know, it, it uh, I think I had like 5,000 or something followers already, you know, because of my blog post and so on, yeah. but not the amount that I had so far. And also not the, 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 the people, you know, because I didn't manage people so far. Mm. Um, and then I started, ah, okay, I, I need to create content that makes sense for people to join Idealo yeah. and also projects where I can actually have a sustainable way of basically maintaining, you know, the, the team in some way, right? Because uh, uh, at Idealo, it, 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 the company was 18 years old. Uh, it's a bit, of, I mean, it's 18 years sounds pretty young, but mm. then, you know, the whole tech stack and things like that was was pretty old fashioned, right? Yeah. So it was, wasn't really modern. I think, I mean, at that time, they were still running a lot of stuff on Perl <laughs> and they just started to migrate to, 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 to Spring Boot, right? Um, and, uh, and, uh, for me, open source, you know, was one of the core pillar to, to, of the strategy to maintain also to open up the company itself. Right. Yeah. So I knew data was important, but I also wanted to help the company, you know, to become modern, right. In a way. Awesome. So I, I created, uh, the Idealo, uh, tech blog, right. Mm. Um, I created the Twitter channel and everything else. So, uh, this is funny because you always think, HR or someone else would, <laughs> yeah. would do it, but it actually it was coming from me and I created, you know, an ecosystem around that, right? So open source would drive the blog post, blog post would drive open source, uh, blog post would drive Twitter, going to conferences would drive all of this together, right? Um, awesome. and, and, and over the time, you know, uh, it became also very, uh, popular. So, I mean, one of the projects like image that, uh, um, I, I described at the beginning, uh, got 4,000 stars, like, you know, like it's, it's, uh, so it's, it's actually, it's actually like something that was part, you know, when, when I started doing that at the time. Yeah. Yeah. I love hearing that you, building your network can go on various ways. Right. But if that's your main goal, then sure, that's going to be one of your goals. But the best thing is if you love what you're doing and through that, you can build your network. Right. And that can be through putting out content that can be through gaining a position by being bold in that way as well. And picking yeah. up things to add value to a company while also extending your personal network. I really love those examples. That I had a lot of fun covering your journey through Price Loop, your past as well, and, and your take on open sourcing. Is there anything that's still missing that you would still like to share with our audience before we round off? Uh, no. So thanks, Patrick, for inviting me. So uh, I had a nice chat with you. And uh, yeah, I think uh, we, we covered uh, quite a bit of things. And uh, yeah, hopefully it might be also interesting for potential founders, you know, or people who are, who are also tech uh, savvy, right? And who wants to found or like, you know, be in the same journey as me in the future, because at the end of the day, I, I still think that there are too few like tech founders, right? Mm. Who, 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 who basically do this in Europe, especially. Yeah. So, uh, the founding scene 
in Europe is, is very driven by business and business schools. Uh, and I actually would like to see more like uh, tech founders, like really tech founders, right? Uh, who would also shape kind of the future of technology here in Europe uh, and create, yeah, unicorns. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that note. I, apparently they're all in Tel Aviv, I recently find out, found out. Yeah. But we're going to round it off here then. Thank you so much for listening. I'm going to put all that socials in the description below. Check him out. If you're one of those tech founders and you want to come on, hit, hit us up. We'll make an episode happen. And in any case, thank you for listening. We'll see you on the next one.